I'd like to begin by asking Chester if you would speak about your experience as a young man of meeting P.H. Polk, um, who Polk was and how you related to his photographs and how meeting him uh, influenced your involvement with photography. Yes, well, Mr. Polk was the um, <clears throat> university photographer who photographed for the student newspaper, student uh, um, annual, and I was the business manager for the paper and I come up with this idea of how we can make more money, which means that we can have more pages in the paper for this ambitious editor at the time. So I thought of asking Mr. Pope to make photographs of local merchants who at the time were only running just replicas of the business card to make display ads. And uh, he agreed to do so, we uh, hired him. But on the day that we had to go to press, he had not produced the pictures. So the editor went one way with the copy to the press and I had to go to Mr. Polk's house, the studio to pick up the prints. And I get there and I said, Mr. Polk, we have a problem. Uh, I haven't received your prints, we're on deadline uh, and I need them now. He said, well, okay. He said, well, I don't have the prints but I did make the pictures. So I just have to process the film and make prints. I said, okay, how long would that take? He said, oh, not long. So. I sit on his front, uh, in his front porch, uh, attached to his, to his studio showroom and waiting. And he comes down finally and he says, okay, I, I processed the film, come let's take a look and make, make selections. So I go up and upstairs behind this big black uh, cloth and to his dark room and I see red light, I hear water, liquids. And um, he looks, I can't really tell, but this is the first time I ever saw negatives, so I couldn't read them. He said, I think I'll pick this one, this one. I said, okay, great. So he picks them and then he starts making prints. I go back downstairs. And this time I notice <clears throat> that when I open up the, the black uh, cloth, that's backdrop, I notice these pictures that I had gotten a glimpse of when he was going up earlier and I was able to pay attention to them. And the pictures were interesting because they were very dignified images of people of black people in the South that you didn't see in the white media. The white media <clears throat> always looked at, at pictures, uh, looked at my people, the photographers looked at my people as um, on the verge of being uh, disgusting or criminals. And Mr. Polk's pictures uh, did just the opposite. He captured the dignity that we, that we see all around us. And it reminded me of the dignity of the people in my hometown, the little village uh, 80 miles south of Tuskegee. But having hired him for this work, I knew on a student budget, I could not afford to hire him to go travel down to my hometown and make pictures of my relatives. So I asked, I said, I gotta do this. I gotta get this done. But when I come back, I wanna talk to you about those pictures. And I did. <clears throat> so I said, well, Mr. Pope, tell me about these pictures. And he said, well, uh, these were made during the depression and that on the weekend, on Saturdays, farmers will come past his house along this road in front of him called Washington Avenue on their way to the market. And every now and then, he would be, while he would be looking out, every now and then he would see what he called a real special character. And then he would run out after that person, ask them to come and make a, let him make a picture of them and, and also tell them that he'll give them $5. Well, that was a clinker, a clincher, because that was $5 more they could spend at the market. So they will come into a studio and he would use his big camera and he will make their picture and they would be on their way. So, you know, I was really touched because they were special studies of, of people's character. And the fact that everybody else had to pay Mr. Polk to have, to make, have him make pictures. In this situation, Mr. Polk was paying people himself. And these pictures, um, <clears throat> he didn't think that they were ever, you know, amount to earning any money for him, but they made his heart happy. And that to me was quite touching. So I said to him, I said, look, Mr. Polk, there's some pictures of hometown people that I like to make pictures of, but I can't afford to pay you to go make these pictures. Would you teach me how to make pictures at your camera? So I didn't realize what I was asking him. <clears throat> this is the only person I knew who had a camera. So he looks at me for a while and he studies me in a way old people can do. And he said, well, let me understand something. You want me to loan you the only camera that I make a living with to learn how to be a photographer? So 
in my innocence, I thought he was questioning my sincerity. And I said, well, yes, sir, Mr. Polk, that's right. So he looks at me a little lonely. He doesn't say anything. And finally, he says to me, he says, you know what I'm going to do? He says, if you're fool enough to ask me, I'm going to be fool enough to help you. So <laughs> we worked out that he spends a couple hours taking a nap on a Saturday afternoon. And I could come by that Saturday afternoon and walk around with his camera. And I did. And I got to the end of the roll. And I came back to him. And he processed it. And only about two of the images came out. And he was livid. So, but I got the feeling from that, that he really didn't want me borrowing his camera. So I didn't ask him ever again for his camera, but instead I would show up at his house and I saw the place was littered with pictures. And I would just ask questions about the pictures all around. And in the process, he helped me learn the history of what he had captured and the meaning of what he had captured, but also he demystified the process of working with people and, pho and photographing. And then the next year, that summer, I was able to buy my first camera, and that, and he graciously allowed let me hire him to process my film for a while, and that's how my uh, my uh, interaction with Mr. Polk how it happened. He was a great guy; I, I really loved him. Um, that's the Polk story. <laughs> that's fabulous. <laughs> and the exhibition includes uh, a few works that you took in the South. Um, early works. Uh, yep. This is one from 67 <laughs> and um, 69. Yep. Yeah, and, then, and then uh, several of Uncle March 4th McGowan. Um, was this a relative of yours? That... Yeah, my great, my great uncle March 4th was um, a relative on my father's side, my, actually my stepfather's side. And he was uh, an incredible guy. I mean, he uh, used to, when I, I grew up, he used to babysit me. And then we used to go hunting together and fishing together. Uh, he lived to die at, a, at a 108. Um, and um, it's interesting, when he was born, he had a brother who was born before him, that his father was always wanting a baby boy. And the mother kept delivering girls. In fact, she delivered about five or six girls. And she finally got a boy. And the father was so happy, he gave all that boy, they gave that boy all the names he'd been saving up each time the mother was pregnant. So his his older brother was named Gabriel Augusta Preston Brown, <laughs> Elijah John McGowan. And we call him John for short. <clears throat> so then Mama Lucy gets pregnant again, and uh, they not quite, they haven't, they, you know, and the father had no more names. So finally the midwife says, you have to have a name for this kid's birth certificate. So finally the father, says to the, to the wife, what day was this kid born? March 1st. Okay, that's his name, March 4th. So oh, that's right. March 4th, the gallon. That's fabulous. And, and this is him at um, his hands. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, there yeah, we go. his hands when, we, when at 105, we had to put him into a nursing home. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. They had burned the house down once before, so it was time. <laughs> um, a number of your photographs were taken of people inside a church, and this one is obviously outside. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role that the church had in your young life and about uh, the significant childhood experience that you had and recounted in your book, Echoes of the Spirit, <clears throat> that I alluded to earlier. Well, you know, church had always been something in my life that I didn't really pay much attention to. And after age nine, my grandfather was a minister. But at age nine, I had this uh, apparition, or actually this uh, uh, this dream or a uh, nightmare uh, that came into my life. Um, I uh, heard in my head one night this sound, and I woke up and I saw this this tunnel of light, this, this circle of light on the wall. And inside it was a, a man in ancient clothing. And um, so I didn't know what it meant. I thought it was quite a, kind of interesting because there was nothing that came off of it that seemed nefarious, it was dangerous. And then this thing began to move towards me and said, finally said, I want you. And then at that point I, I felt I screamed because I thought, well, the little thing I've heard about church is that this angel that comes after me, maybe this is the angel of death coming after me. And I really screamed because I felt at nine years old, I was just too young to die. And uh, my mother and my grandparents came into the room and when they pulled down the chain light, this apparition went away. Uh, but after that, um, I, it must've been something because my grandfather gave me a Bible and I just 
took to the Bible like fish to water, and church took on another meaning that it never, a deeper meaning than it had before in my life. So I became two things. I became aware that there was a spiritual uh, life that was parallel to what is obvious. And I also became aware of how people try to communicate with it uh, and how it is something that, um, not something not to fear. And that is really, um, as time goes by, I say to people in my work, I try to capture the signature of the spirit. I look at what is in front of me, but I also know that there's something else behind it. And I try to make sure that I get both of those things in the same image. Right. Is a kid like me in church, stuck in church, because <laughs> he can't go out. He's got to stay there with his parents and grandparents all day. Yeah, that's a great image. A young woman uh, in Atlanta. Yeah, I'm uh, really struck by the way your photographs portray individuals sort of by themselves or with others in, in really very quiet, thoughtful moments, or as couples where you feel a kind of electricity with, between them. Was that something you intentionally look for or sort of found spontaneously? Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by, by human behavior. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the mind in a, in, in a given moment. And I try to, and with people, I try to dive right in behind the facade. I try to get to the meaning of what's going on, the, the, uh, what's inspiring them, what's, what's charging the moment. Um, or like here, you know, uh, home leave, uh, Navy guy, um, and just accept what they are doing and how they're doing it without judgment and to try to embrace it completely. So that's what you're seeing. Yeah. And cool. see here, you know, just here's All a right. sheer joy, sheer happiness, trying to, to just be able to ride that, that moment with people. Uh, that is special to them and that's made that a, and by being there in front of the specialness and being able to capture a uh, part of that specialness is what I think um, charges the photograph so that the, the viewer can appreciate. Here's another image of shooting into the light, which I mm -hmm. love uh, yeah. of a father swinging his son in the sunset in Tuskegee. Yeah. Um, I love the, the simple things that, um, that are universal. And in that universality, how also how it speaks to each of us, how we find a place within that where we we ourselves can fit. That's yeah, wonderful. I wonder if you could also talk about the political and, and social climate in the South when you were at Tuskegee. Um, this was the late sixties and rallies well, you attended. This was during the time of George Wallace and the, the March, uh, King's March from Selma to Montgomery. And the South has always been a very charged atmosphere when it comes to white black relationships. Um, I wrote in my memoir that, you know, we always felt that being around white people were very dangerous. You know, uh, the cops say it's being dangerous around us, but it's the reverse. They, we, the almost dangerous time as a black person is when we're in the company of white people especially Southern white people. And you don't know, it's like being into a locked in a, in a cage with a, with a rattlesnake. And you don't quite know when and if the rattlesnake is gonna, gonna, is gonna, uh, gonna jump at you. So you're, you're always on alert. Uh, so that the only time that you really have to be a uh, human and, be, and let your guard down is when you're in the company of each other. So that's why in the, in the South, the institutions of the church, the barber shop, the, the uh, school situations are so precious. Here you have a situation where you have people who were brave enough to come downtown Montgomery to listen to SCLC rally. May I call this looking for justice. These people, uh, a lot of people were too afraid to stand, to take a stand and to be in that place because they knew that uh, there may be repercussions. They are local people, the people who are given a rally don't live there, uh, but here are people who felt that, they, that their rights were important enough uh, that they were gonna make a, take a stand and learn how to further that. Here's Jesse Jackson. Uh, one of my first job uh, out of college was for, uh, story was for uh, uh, Look Magazine where I spent a week traveling the country following Jesse Jackson. It ended up in a five page spread. And this was a rally where in California somewhere where uh, the, 
people of all ages come to Easter Valley. And here you see one of the youngest who come and had a question to, uh, to Jackson, Reverend Jackson, after the rally that uh, he's paying attention to and his assistants are paying attention to, uh, that this is a very, this young child had a, a very serious uh, issue on her mind that meant a lot to her. And they were right there, they were hooked together in this conversation. This is when um, African-American professional people who are studying to be professionals uh, see how the political system works for white people. And they're saying, well, maybe we can make this system work for us. And, and this is a, a national black political convention where people came together talking about strategy and how they go back to their communities and, and organize it and, in order to get things done. This is a great um, photograph I love. Um, and there's a poster in the back, uh, on the back wall behind the barber. And yep. I wondered if you could just tell us what, what the oh. significance of that was. Yeah, this is a very significant poster because in the homes of black people in the South, there will probably be uh, one or two things on the wall. One is a, is a farmer's almanac and a picture of Jesus Christ. But after the murder of Johnson, I mean, of Kennedy's, of the Kennedy brothers and King, some illustrator came up with this idea of having these three men um, um, immortalized. And people bought this post and put on their walls. And I say to people that this is, a, this is the only, only three Ks that we Black people can live with, the right. Kennedy, King, and Kennedy. Right. In the summer of 1969, I believe you went to New York to visit, and, and yep. while, while you were there, um, met Arthur Rothstein, yep. who, who was both a photographer and at the time the director of photography at Look Magazine. Right. Could you talk a little bit about how you happened to meet him and, and how he influenced your work well, and your life? Actually, when I came to New York, I went to newsstands and I looked up every magazine that treated pictures well. And I looked to see who the picture of what it would be were, and I called them up and I said, "Look, I'm a photographer. I'm a student photographer from Tuskegee. I'm not looking for a job. I'm looking for a teacher. Uh, because you guys see the best photographers. Can you look at my work and tell me what's my gap?" So I went to several. Uh, I had you know good response from most people, and I was sitting in the office of Sam Young at, at Look Magazine, and he really wasn't a teacher. He was nice. But it was just fortuitous that this short bald head man stuck his head through the door. And he says something to Sam and Sam straightened up, which told me that was Sam's boss. And so he gave Sam an order and Sam's okay. And then he looked at me and he said, well, to Sam, he said, well, who's this? What's going on here? And Sam said, well, there's this kid from Tuskegee. He wants to be a photographer. Uh, and I we were looking at his work. So he said, okay, Sam, when you finish, send him into my office. So the door closed. I looked at Sam. Sam looked at me. We both knew we were finished. So Sam says, when you go out the door, turn right, go to the end of the hall, and that's Mr. Rothstein's office. I didn't know who this, what this name meant. So I go to his office. I sit down. And uh, he says, well, OK, well, what's going on? What's your story? And I start to tell him. I'm from Tuskegee. I don't, there's no school to so study photography. I want to learn how to get better because I want to change how people see my people. And he said, wow, that's a pretty tall order. I said, well, that's the only one I got. So he said, okay, well, show me what you've got. So I started showing my pictures and he started taking out four pieces of paper and putting them on the picture and sliding them back and forth. And he said, well, come here, look there, there's your picture. And I looked at this picture and I said, oh my God, that's a great picture. Did I make that picture? He said, well, you know, you made the picture, but you didn't know it because you have all this other stuff that's competing with it. What you have, you have to understand, you have to learn to understand design, balance, composition, subject matter. And I said, well, do it in another one. Let me see. So we did this. And then I said, well, I'm going to go out tomorrow and see if I can internalize what you've taught me and bring in my work in a couple of days. Because, you know, as a student, uh, we couldn't afford uh, fresh rolls of film. You had to buy a hundred foot roll of film and roll your own in reusable canisters. And he says, no, no, no. He said, here, take a couple of rolls of film. I said, my God, this is incredible. I got fresh film. And he said, well, and don't process it. Bring it back tomorrow and we'll process it here. So I went back with this film, we went through it and I learned something. He says, well, you know, I'm trying to learn how to put in practice what he taught me. So I'm doing that. But he says, you know, okay, I want to look at your contacts only, no prints, because your contacts tells me how you develop a thought. 
how you develop. Uh, and then that whole, that, that day, two days, became a whole summer. Each day, I'm having new experiences, discussing new things. He's pointing me in new directions, uh, sending me up to the first museum I've ever been to in my life. There was no such museum you want to go to in, in Alabama, or could you go to being Black? He sent me to the, the Frick and the, Ma, and the MoMA uh, uh, met with a list of people. He says, look, I want you to look at these people and come back and tell me what you think about it. I don't care if you like them or dislike them. I just want to know why. So that this guy was a teacher I had been looking for. And this whole summer became an intense study of learning so that I've learned from him because of him. I learned visual linguistics. I learned that all the different things that I have to decide, he says a photographer has to make 200 decisions in a moment and making a picture, uh, but you have to learn each of those things individually. So he gave me this list of things, of maybe of uh, 60 things that happened and how to identify each one of them. Uh, and that was, that, was, that was a great way of teaching. I learned very well, I actually, Decades later, Cornell Coppola said that I was uh, Arthur's best student of all of his students. I turned out to be the best one. But I, I was just, but I had a mission that I had to deal with. I was eager to learn how to fulfill the mission of making sure that I returned to the, that I put into the visual document the things that were always missing about my people. And those were the issues of decency, dignity, and virtuous character. I wasn't into the, um, uh, to to the um, the hardship or the negativity, uh, people were doing that better than I could. Uh, I wasn't into the friction. I was into what was valuable about our lives. What was the what was the civil rights fight all about? It was about the value of of the humanity of my people, and that's what I, that was the window that I wanted to fill, and that was the window that I I looked for and and search and make, to make photographs of. And Rothstein helped me. <clears throat> what a great experience. Um, so, living in New York must have been a huge change, um, but your photographs continued um, by turns to have a wonderful sense of this exuberant energy and a quiet sense of reflection. Um, what did you think about New York as a place to make photographs um, compared to <clears throat> Alabama? Well, you know, the, they're the same people, just a different environment. Uh, the same, my, my people are, uh, I find inspirational everywhere I go. Uh, the, just the environment changes, but the people are the same. The spirit is the same. And I'm seeing, obviously I'm seeing things that, that other photographers who, who breeze through doing, uh, uh, but who are not in a part of the community, things that are below their radar that they just don't see um, because they don't, uh, they don't have a lot of noise to them. Uh, so I'm not interested in the noise. I'm interested in the depth, and I find it um, wherever we are. And it's I find it quite interesting. You know, in Tuskegee, we had to read a lot of books by uh, authors like um, James Baldwin, uh, Anne Petrie, uh, uh, Ellison. So we had a, a sort of, uh, and these authors gave us a very layered um, understanding of humanity and the, how the and, and its uniqueness to black people. So that was a backdrop to my looking at New York. Uh, even though I hadn't been there before, I had read so much about people living in New York that I had a, uh, I've been able to mix the two or uh, to make that transition from those Southerners who moved North, but who are still Southerners, but living in different kind of uh, conditions. But <clears throat> at the same time, uh, do, continuing the practice and the traditions of their elders and their ancestors down south. Um, you, you mentioned earlier this shooting into the light and um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about it. Those, you have several photographs that are in the exhibition uh, resemble silhouettes and silhouettes have of course a long history in portraiture and also in art. Um, that extends to the present and contemporary artists, you know, maybe most notably Carol Walker. Um, but I wonder if you could talk about how you use this, about your shooting into the light and how your use of the silhouette. Um, 
Well, the silhouette, the silhouette for me does simplifies the emotion, simplifies the moment because you know I give you fewer things that your eye can register in terms of detail, but I give you at the same time uh, I, I give a I give a summation of what you are looking what you are looking at and experiencing. I I see that the the tunnel of light coming at me to is just as can be just as powerful as the light as the light behind me. Um, I think it could be actually more revealing uh, if you're looking at the way I'm trying to look at the signature of the spirit. So that what you can't see um, is, 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 it doesn't no longer compete with what you're understanding with the whole, the fabric of the whole image that you're looking at. So I can tell, I can capture a story, I can capture emotion well, um, and I can uh, make you hopefully uh, give you a sense of intimacy when from something that's unexpected. You may expect intimacy from something that you can obviously see, but here I'm trying to give you a sense of intimacy from something that is absent. That's great. And while you were in, in New York, um, you had a long career as a photographer for the New York Times. and. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you balance that with your own work and, and whether that was, was challenging. Well, my work for the Times began after my after the sole television show went out of business. Uh, I was doing freelance for the Times Arts and Leisure section, um, always shooting portraits. And, uh, then I, and I was publishing books. I was doing grass, trying to do whatever I could to survive uh, and take care of my, my wife and two children. And, and then when I got the offer the Times job uh, in 75, um, my, I thought it was great because I didn't change how I saw people. What it allowed, I thought, was a chance for me to integrate into the Times pages my view of my people along with uh, whatever else the Times does because the Times is something that, uh, that decision makers look at. And I wanted this, and I wanted to broaden the understanding of my people that in image makers will see. There again, I wanted to sh take advantage of the fact of my intimacy, my political uh, direction of the getting of showing those e those issues of decency, dignity, and and virtuous character. And I wanted to uh, make sure that on this on the American stage of information. Uh, people in addition to whatever else they saw. They saw my interpretation of people of color. So I didn't shoot any differently. My eye was still working. My eye was still practicing. Um, and what I did, but what I did is I also made a parallel opportunity for my work in places where the times wouldn't go as far as I wanted them to go. And that's where I was, why I was doing my books alongside of it. Because of my books, <clears throat> I could extend um, on a riff, so to speak, that uh, that had no place in the Times, while at the same time trying to integrate that work into the Times. But it was the same eye, uh, just exercising it more and trying to reach a larger community. Because if in fact, I really believed that I, 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 I wanted people to have a different understanding of my people, then I, I, it, it was um, to my advantage to be able to reach larger communities. And to have the uh, the uh, the imperture of the New York Times carrying my images work well for me. Right, a lot of people remember you from the Times. Um, remarkable. While you were in New York, you met Gordon Parks, and um, and I love this photograph. It was interesting to me that Polk and Parks both had. Um, different messages to you about photography. Um, <laughs> Polk said, and I'm going to quote ho hopefully correctly, there is no camera that can make a picture. Only your eyes can make a picture. And uh, Gordon Park said, great photographs are made with the heart, not necessarily the eye. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what these two messages meant to you and how <laughs> you integrated them into your work. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, first of all, that Polk's advice legitimized um, what my thought. And Park's advice legitimized my feelings. 
So the two of those, I think, was a, a, a it's like a parallel a railroad tra track that I could that that I could be the engine, uh, motoring down. And uh, I felt that these guys actually gave me it was their shoulders that I was standing upon, that fed into my own uh, desires and my own inspiration uh, that I was doing the right thing and was going the right way. Um, Parks, um, it, it was Arthur Rostan who introduced me to Parks. Um, and uh, Parks, when I went to meet him the first time and we were talking and I told him what I wanted to do, he said, okay. He said, well, you know, when you are freelancing and you get a job from Time or Newsweek or whoever, and they send you into a situation that is negative and you want to shoot it positive, you should do that. He said, but if you make the mistake on a roll of 36, and you shoot 35 the way you want. And the 36, you slip and you shoot it to what they're expecting and looking for. That's the one they're going to run. So he said, don't ever give them that choice. Make all 36 what you want. So my some, uh, Parks became a very good mentor in terms of how to understand the business. Pokes became a very good mentor in how to understand the, uh, the, the process of dealing with people. Uh, and and Rothstein became the... the the influence of how to actually uh, read and see photography, how to parcel the spaces out. Uh, so th these guys are very important people in my life. Yeah. Uh, I believe you also met Cornell Kappa while you were in New York. Was he a, a Cornell, friend or a figure to you? Cornell also is someone that Rothstein introduced me to. And Cornell was, you know, was a very passionate guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, his favorite word about something he liked is terrific, terrific. <laughs> really great guy. And, and, and Cornell was the kind of guy, though, who was kind of like, I would think um, Cornell was more like the shrink of photographers. <laughs> he, he's a guy who sort of uh, questions what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're doing it. Um, and pushing and always pushing you. Uh, um, and, you know, pushing you at what you think you would think you want to do. Uh, he would take that and, 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 and needle you with it and, and, uh, and push you along. And, and that was, and that was, a, he, Cornell is, a, is the uncle everybody needs. So um, I, so, and, and Cornell made a lot of, made a lot of opportunities for me. Um, and I'm very appreciative, appreciative of that. Uh, and getting to know him as, a, as as all of my mentors as a friend as well. That's great. I'm particularly impressed with the the intensity and and actually incredible beauty of of your portraits. They have a a very strong sense of presence and and the energy of the individual, but they also have this amazing sculptural quality. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what draws you to make a particular portrait, particularly these in, in the exhibition. I'm usually drawn to spirit and countenance um, in a person. And yes, I see the eyes as windows to the soul and I'm trying to dive into that person. And I wanna take advantage of whatever is structurally happening with their physical makeup to add to that picture because you know we grow uh, we grow into our bones and our bones absorb who we are and absorb our experiences cheekbones facial bones all of the, the skin how it wraps around us all of that tells about our experiences so I'm always trying to fully open up and appreciate what is what is the spirit wearing on itself what is what is it what has it put upon the body? What is it put upon the bones, upon the layers, upon the, the mind, the thought? And how do I just get in there um, and just, and, and just um, hug it, uh, embrace it? And uh, so that I come away with a statement of what it looked like, but also what it is. And so that it's layered. Um, and that's when I think I've, I've been successful. Um, because what it looks like to me is almost unimportant. Uh, it's enough to attract me, but it's not the final thing that I find most important. I find that combination of the spirit with the thing is most important to me. Yeah, that's great. You also photographed a number of musicians. Uh, is music of particular importance to you personally and, and to your work? 
Oh, oh absolutely. Music is, is fundamental because, you know, music is its own language. It's the language of the spirit. It's the one language of the spirit that's not controlled by uh, 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 rules of, of, uh, of grammar. Uh, it has its own rules, but it's something that it touches the spirit in such a way that words just uh, alone cannot. I love listening to music uh, in the in the South. You know, the early music was gospel, then blues, and then I didn't come into jazz until I got to Tuskegee. But I listen to the music, and I and if it's a vocalist, uh, I listen. I try to in my ear sort of reduce the vocalist to an instrument, and that uh, works well for me. It also allows me to appreciate foreign languages and music very well. Uh, but music is what makes the heart smile. And I try to capture the intensity that's going on within the, the performer, uh, what they're feeling and how they're feeling it. Uh, because uh, what's on their face also says a lot about how they're communicating with me and our audience and what we're feeling. And this, so this is a, an appreciation of the moment of bliss or the moment of, of work uh, intensity that is going on in the music maker. That's great. Um, you've traveled extensively <laughs> um, throughout your life as a photographer, and this exhibition includes a work from two places that you went to in your early travels, uh, Ghana and Senegal. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you managed that with your full-time job at the Times and why you chose the locations you went to and what, what was particularly important to you, like beginning with Ghana? Um, okay, that, that travel is in two sections. There's a section after Tuskegee and there's a section after the New York Times. At Tuskegee, I was very moved by uh, African students who were friends of mine who were from uh, Nigeria and Ghana uh, and Kenya who had books that I read uh, from authors from their countries, mostly political. Uh, so, and, so in Tuskegee, we were very Afrocentric. So in 71, I had my first opportunity to go to photograph in uh, Senegal for Essence Magazine. <clears throat> and I really uh, found that a very uh, profound experience. And then I went back uh, and I found a way to get a grant from the Ford Foundation to go back and study uh, uh, in, in an English speaking country because Senegal was a French speaking, a Wolof speaking country to an English speaking country to look for, to study uh, the traditional behavior and how the society was moving from a traditional way of life to a modern way of life. So I got sponsors. Uh, one of my sponsors was Elliot Skinner, the anthropologist at Columbia and Margaret Mead and Arthur Rothstein. And I went back and I spent the summer uh, in Ghana doing this work because the grant helped me also pay for my trip, but also pay for, for supporting my family while I was away. And then I did the same thing in 74, uh, getting a, a cheap charter flight and spending the summer there again. Uh, and when I would travel, I travel with a charter flight of uh, educators. And these people stayed in the, in the city of Accra, of Accra, but as a photographer, you know, you've got to travel. So I hitchhiked all the way to the north, village to village, and finding people I could attach myself to so that I could become their friend and become the fly on the wall and just uh, experience the life as, as it was lived. Uh, and then 74, summer back in Senegal. And then after working with the Times, uh, my vacation started out a week. So when I got to two weeks, I spent two weeks uh, in Senegal. And as, it got, uh, as time went by, I realized that I could get overtime or pay. So I elected overtime. I will work overtime, not get money, but get time. And if, uh, gradually I was up to six weeks a year. So all of that time, uh, except uh, maybe three or four years, I was spending in some part of Africa, uh, looking at my cousins, reflections of myself. Um, and, I, and, and personally, I found uh, spending the money to go in Africa was cheaper than therapy uh, for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> Um, this particular image, uh, I wonder if you could talk about that location. It's this, a, this, uh, along, along the West African coast, during the time of, of slavery, um, European merchants would have uh, holding pens that they develop into buildings or castles. 
in which the, uh, the slaves or the Africans who had been captured will be held until ships arrive to take them from their six week journey across the Atlantic. Here's one of those slave castles in the island of Frenchman on the island of Gorey in Dakar. And they call this the door of no return. And the reason is because outside of this door was a gangplank that took you down to a pier where ships would be docked. So each African who walked through this door would never this would be the last of, uh, piece of African soil that they would touch and they would never come back. So at this particular door, um, I was uh, shooting and um, I noticed that my uh, guide, Madame Ba, was sort of relaxing in the door. Uh, of course, she was, uh, her feet were a little more closer to the right and I saw it and I said, oh, please, Madame Ba, could you extend your feet? She's a very long woman. They're very tall people in Senegal. Extend the feet to the end, which she did, and that was my perfect silhouette to show mm -hmm. that movement of going out but never coming back in, but that door that people disappeared through. Mm -hmm. There are a few more from Here's Senegal. another shot of Madame Ba. She had she very tall, very long, the longest necks I've ever seen in my life, where the women in Senegal, the wool of women. And here again, using uh, the silhouette of trying mm -hmm. to give you a suggestion of what you don't see, but you don't have to see it to know it, but you know it from, this, from the silhouette. Beautiful image. And then this is a village I lived in for a while in, the, uh, in Senegal in the beginning, a village called Yoff. It's a fishing village. I lived in this shack uh, that this uh, African-American woman who was a uh, jewelry maker let me uh, put, <clears throat> live in a pallet in another, an adjoining room. And we were maybe 50, feet of, uh, 50 to 100 feet away from the ocean coming on when high tide. And uh, the people will come down in the afternoon or midday uh, for the fishermen when they come in. Uh, to, to buy fish fresh off the boat and then return to the village back up hill. So this is the village of Yoff. Uh, those, uh, and here's a, a corner of a street in Dakar. This is a, of a house in Dakar with the shutters open. And on that beach, one, this is a fisherman who are coming in after a day of, of, at sea, heading back home. Besides um, the work that you did for the New York Times uh, and your work appeared in magazines and I think you made still photographs for TV and film, if I'm not incorrect, yeah, um, yeah. as well as publishing oh, many books, many of which I mentioned earlier. Are there any that stand out particularly significant or um, would you like to speak about the new book that you have coming out? Um, Sacred well, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, all of my books have been about, and, and all of my work is about identity, looking at identity. Black woman is about looking at female identity uh, in the times of, uh, this, uh, of the civil rights movement, Black Power Movement. Drums of Life looked at the identity of men as fathers, men as, uh, as friends. And then um, 20 years later, uh, the book, um, Feel the Spirit looked at the, the collective identity of the world family of African people. Uh, and now I'm looking at the sacred agency of African identity and sacred now. This is a book I've been working on. I didn't know I'd been working on it for 50 years until I was about to finish it. But it's from my first trip to Egypt and Ethiopia was in 73. And that started a, uh, a whole, whole um, avenue of curiosity that I had to spend decades to figure out what it is I was looking at and then spend another couple of decades to figure out well we're in this whole body of work on the Blue Nile and ancient Egypt can I say something that hasn't been said that's different and so I, I decided to look at the spiritual legacy of ancient Egypt and how it affected uh, religion up until this time and looking at uh, the people who, uh, out of whose my ancient minds of metaphysics uh, developed religion and looking at the record they left behind where the earliest, uh, according to Herodotus, uh, the earliest people, the first people to worship a God were the ancient Egyptians. And according to what's left behind in stone texts of 2500 BCE, the earliest people to develop uh, religious 
theory and thought and philosophical thought for uh, the Egyptians and we have it in the tomb of Unas. So this book is about, that is a portrait of the uh, philosophical and sacred mind and how that portrait belongs to a place and how that place is, is uh, peopled by the people from ancient Egypt, ancient Sudan and today's Ethiopia. So it tells that story, and I say it's the story of the sacred agency of people of African identity. It's going to come out in October. In fact, today is the first day that it goes on press in China. Uh, it's, it's 232 pages, uh, and I hope that everybody uh, find a place for it on your on your gift shopping list. Well, we will look forward to it, and um, thank you very much, Chester. Um, and I think that we'll uh, open it up to questions now. I'm going to stop. Um, Carrie, before before we, uh, Chester, thank you very much. That was uh, really extraordinary. And uh, it was, uh, I learned so much from this. And Carrie, thank you for, um, uh, for your insightful questions. Uh, I, I just wanted to say it's been an honor uh, to present this work. Um, Chester, and uh, thank you for, for giving this opportunity uh, for us and uh, Carrie for your vision in, uh, in curating the show and your extraordinary selection. It's been truly a pleasure to work with you. Um, so let's, um, let's go to questions, Francis. Yes, thank you both so much. And for everybody who posted questions in the chat, we appreciate it. So the first one is from Jermaine Williams. Um, especially for your early works of family members, what kind of response did you get from your sitters and subjects? Well, all my response, I found it been very positive. And I think it's positive because of, of the way I approach people. First of all, <clears throat> as Cornell Coppola says, if you want to photograph people, you have to love them and let them know that you, that you love them. But secondly, I approach people, yes, I appreciate what they're doing. I want to highlight what they're doing and I'm not and I am non-judgmental. And I think that combination, when people feel they can trust you and at ease with you, then I think all things are possible. Another thing I say is to people is that you must never try to take away a person's right to say no. You have to ask for the picture. You can't, if they say no, that no means no. It doesn't mean that you try to get around the no. And I think when people realize that they are in control, that they, there's their image and that there's their moment. And even though you may love it, it's their decision. And once they, have, they know that all those things are in place, I find that, that people are very positive and very opening. Fabulous, the consent of image making. Um, a question from Robert G. I don't want to mispronounce his last name. He asked if you ever had the opportunity to meet Roy de Caraba and follow up to that question um, about bookmaking, which comes first, the idea or the photos, the idea or the photos or a combination of both? Yes, I had opportunity to meet Rodi Caraba uh, several times and I'm very impressed with him. You know, he's uh, speaking of music. Rodi Caraba loved music too, and he played a, a saxophone. Um, but he, and he was also very, um, but you know, um, he made work that really stands the test of time. He saw stuff in the darkness that there again, it's the absence of light that he really perfected and how to make the imagery of his people sing. And he did that very well. Books, the ideas always come first. I mean, you can, you know, you can, you know, if you want to just do a book or pictures, obviously you can put them together. But whether you want them to mean anything, you have the idea has to come first. And that comes from a, a one of my mentors, uh, Romy Bearden. When he first looked at my work, he said, "Well, I see that you can make finger exercises, but can you make a symphony?" Same thing. You can take, you can put pictures on a page, but can you make them mean something? And that's what the idea is important about. A question from Janet Fisher. Can you say more about the process of looking and the length of time it takes to recognize what you're looking at? <laughs> Janet, <laughs> how much time do you have? But look, let me say this. <clears throat> I think I benefited from, from a habit that I had as a child that I didn't realize, but my mother would tell me. She'd say, stop staring. 
because I could sit and watch people and watch things and watch it go through its cycle and, and not feel uh, th that I have to, you know, hurry up. But the most important lesson I think I learned was from my mentor, Romy Bearden, about looking at life as a ceremony. He says, all life, it doesn't change. It's a ceremony and it's broken up into pieces. You have to realize what the pieces look like and you can always capture it. You know what, it, it, would, it would make your capturing much fuller. I'll give you a quick example. He says, imagine you go into a restaurant, you walk into the restaurant and let's graph it out. You walk in, that's A. You look around, that's B. The waiter comes to you, that's D. You sit down, that's probably G. You order, that's M. You finish, that's X. You get your, 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 your check and you return to the door and that's Z, that's Z. So as a photographer, you have to anticipate what you're looking for. But if you know that everything is on a graph, you could then have the luxury of time of deciding where on the graph you want that picture. So therefore you can decide what angle you wanna be when that moment happens. You can look for the light and the composition to be at that, because you're heading that moment at the, off at the pass. But you have to think about the moment you're after to know where you are, where, how to maximize it, which means where you have to be, how you have to be, blah, blah, blah. But if you can see life as a ceremony, that gives you a graph. And then on top of that graph, you then layer on things about visual linguistics. And the combination of those two is what is needed, the needed ingredients and your feeling and your confidence and your int intuition gives, makes it a great picture. Wow, great. And a, a question that follows that from Liz Hunter, which is asking maybe more of a, um, a personal take on what you just said. How has photography changed your life in seeing your culture and your own life? Well, I'm not sure photography has changed my life because photography has just essentially been the tool to amplify what my eyes and heart experience in the culture of my people, living with my people. Uh, so I want my photography to change the lives of viewers who come and see it. And they are seeing the product of my living. They're seeing the product of my reality. They're seeing the product of my culture. Um, that's, uh, now if you, if you want to talk about technically how it's changed, that's something else. But photography is a tool. It's a tool in which I can exchange information. I can capture information about what I think is important. I can uh, render that information to a two-dimensional format that is then um, meaningful to a viewer. Excellent. And in our chat, there's a slew of really lovely comments and thank yous to you and Carrie. Um, and our next question comes from George Slade, which is your gratitude to your mentors and teachers is so inspiring. Are you now guiding younger photographers in that same fashion? I always take time when younger photographers come to me. You know, the best way to be a mentor is you have to be a self-starter. So that means that mentors who have always busy have a plate, full plate. They can't really walk you around, but if you have a project you're working on, if you're trying to think through something, mentors are good people to bounce it off and say, hey, yeah, I like where you're going with that. Keep that up. Or had you considered this such and such and such? That's how mentors are helpful. And so when people come to me, young students come to me with their, with their projects, with tell me about their life, I don't want them to be like me. I want them to be like them. Uh, then yes, I, I'm, I'm always open to that. I give him my number, I exchange emails with him. Um, and yeah, because you know, I, it's, I was fortunate, so I do have to give back. But at the same time, I don't wanna be the only one out here doing this. I want, I want a whole front line. So, because one, the subject matter is so vast and the challenge is so vast. So you want hundreds and thousands. I'm, I'm always happy when I see uh, very strong work from other uh, photographers of color on the, on the African-American and African community. That's so great, Chester. Um, another question from Jermaine. Uh, how did you come to understand the print? Have you worked with photo printers? Yes, I understood that. My first understanding of the print came from Mr. Rothstein. <clears throat> 
because you know in, in printing you have to you when you try to do prints you're taught about you know the value of dodging or burning in or uh, perfect exposures or whatever you um, but you know you also have to make a choice and my and my choice was to be uh, the best shooter and that meant that I had to uh, find the best printer I had to know printing to know the best printer but as uh, Mr. Rothstein said there's no reason to take uh, 125th second of a second to make a picture in two hours in a dark room to make it happen. What it means is you have to learn how to zen the film and zen the light. So I tell people light is my mistress. The most important thing to me after the subject is light. So I'm very, 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 I pay a lot of attention to light and light guides me because light is gonna be the force, the activator or the verb of, of, the, of the image and it needs to be something that I don't have to explain or a printer has to be laborious about. It should be something that you can print straight because I'm developing a per I'm shooting a perfect negative. Wow. Um, well, Carrie and Chester, thank you so much. If there's anything else you'd like to add, um, I just wanted to say a note that the indelible spirit will be on view at the gallery through June 26th. And if you're not able to make it physically, we have um, the images on our website as well on his exhibition page. Um, so we hope um, you'll get to view Carrie's selection of Chester's images and we'll hope to see you in the gallery as well. Any last words, uh, Chester, Carrie? Carrie? I just oh. want to thank <laughs> Chester, uh, Bruce, Francis, uh, and all of you for, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank you guys. You're a great team. And um, uh, Bruce, you did a great job with this exhibition. You and Carrie. Ah, it's beautiful. Fantastic. I walk in, I say, oh, I wish I had done this. Oh, but I did do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> thank you, Chester. Okay, guys. <laughs> take care. Okay, thank you.